Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our church. I'm so glad that you decided to make our church part a priority of your Sunday morning plans. We gather together to worship God, to hear from God, uh, to pray to God, and to receive from God's Spirit. So God bless you this morning as, as you're here for that. Just a couple of announcements that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, the first is that this next weekend coming up is our Nimble Fingers program. And that's Friday afternoon, evening, and then Saturday for most of the day. So if you're a crafter, come on out and enjoy the company of fellow crafters. Uh, lunch is going to be provided on Saturday and we just love to see you out for that. And then on May 6th, we're planning our Nerf Community Day. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun here at the church uh, with some Nerf gun battles and bouncy castles uh, and just all kinds of fun for families. Uh, if you'd like to help, I know that Pastor Josh would really appreciate that, especially help with lunch, uh, prepping, cooking, serving, that kind of a thing. So uh, chat with him during or after the service or during the week if you're able to help out with that. Well, we're going to go to a time of prayer and then to our connection time together, uh, just in all of the atmosphere of worship. Uh, we do this because we love God and we love each other and we want to worship uh, through all kinds of different ways. So God bless us this morning. I'm going to be reading from two, two places in the Bible. Verse one is Psalm 18, 30 to 36. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who takes refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield and your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. The second one I'm going to be reading from is Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm, then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Well, before I get really into it, I just wanted to promote this thing again. A uh, number of people uh, picked one up last Sunday. I think I have five left. Uh, it's just, it's a nice glossy pamphlet that talks about the armor of God. A uh, great resource to tuck in your Bible or to have on your kitchen table and just to kind of learn more about uh, what the armor of God is. And so we have these available. I've got five left. And there's seven dollars, but just you know, pick one up today. Include the seven bucks in your tithing. Uh, that's no problem at all. I, I think that you would really, really enjoy having this. Um, and thanks, Jenna. Uh, I think you disappeared off to Sunday school. <laughs> that's just great. Uh, but thank you uh, for for reading our scripture passage this morning. Uh, well, how are your shoes this morning? How are your shoes this morning? So I want you to, uh, to do something for me. Everyone to kind of just look at your neighbor's shoes uh, just for a little bit. And, and then I'd like you to just kind of compliment them on their shoes. You know, maybe their shoes really match their outfit well this morning. 
maybe they're very nice and polished. Uh, maybe they've got cowboy boots on and, and you can compliment them on that. You know, maybe their shoes have seen a lot of miles and you know, they've got lots of stories to tell. Uh, but just kind of compliment people on their shoes. Yeah, that's good. And now I've made everyone really self-conscious about the shoes that they have on their feet. But that's what we're talking about this morning. Because the right shoes make all the difference. The right shoes make all the difference in life. They allow us to walk properly. Uh, they allow us to keep our body moving. Uh, they allow us to travel well. Shoes are very important. And shoes are very important to God because God wants us to be able to navigate life well. God wants us to be able to journey through this world well. And so he's given us the right shoes that we need in order to do this. Uh, but before I begin, why don't we stand and let's pray together. Commit ourselves to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that it is living and breathing and active. It has the power to change our lives. And so we just open ourselves to you this morning and we ask that you would speak and we would hear and that it would trickle down uh, from our ears to our mind to our heart uh, to the very soul of who we are uh, and that we would be changed because of it. So we open ourselves, we give ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a seat. <clears throat> so when we moved from uh, Calgary to Manitoba, uh, 20 some years ago, one of the things that we really, really missed were the mountains, uh, or really any elevation at all. Because Laurel and I like being outdoors. We like being active outdoors, and so what we found, the only thing that we could really do was we spent more and more time doing cross-country skiing, which was fine, uh, but there's a huge difference between downhill ski boots and cross-country ski boots, right? You know, there's a big difference. Both call themselves ski boots. Uh, both attach to skis and allow you to glide across the snow, but that's about the end of the, of the similarities. So I grew up doing, uh, going downhill skiing. I've been downhill skiing since I was a child, and I, was, I got really into it when I was in high school. Now, downhill ski boots are very rigid, and they're very heavy, and they buckle very securely into your skis. And this allows you to control your skis, right? You tell where the skis want to, where they need to go. And this is what I was used to. But cross-country ski boots are very different. They're very soft, they're very flexible, they're lightweight. They only buckle into skis at the toe of the ski. And so what I discovered is that cross-country ski boots do not give you very much control over your skis and this created a lot of problem for me and it was a very steep learning curve and it was something that I never really got fully used to because you don't control the skis anymore. In fact, the skis control you. The skis tell you what you want to do and they're kind, you're just kind of along for the ride. And so my cross-country ski experience looks more like flailing than anything graceful. Two very different boots for two very different purposes. And if you don't know the purposes of it, if you don't know the differences of it, it's going to be very frustrating. You're going to have a bad time. You need the right shoes on your feet. You, you need the right footwear on your feet. If you want to do something specific, you need the right footwear for it. You need to wear dress shoes if you're going to a wedding. You need to wear runners if you're going for a run. Don't mix the two up. Don't go for a run in dress shoes. It's not going to work out well. Don't show up to a wedding in your runners because it's a fashion faux pas and you'll be laughed at. Because the right shoes allow us to do what we need to do. So we're in our Armor of God series. And there's two things that you need to know. Two things that are just kind of guiding themes that we just see come up again and again. And the first is that the armor of God is highly practical. It's highly functional in your life. It's not just some concept that we can talk about, some theological concept that takes a while to wrap your brain around. Uh, it's something that's highly practical. It's highly relevant. And unfortunately, we often leave the armor of God as a children's story. You know, we teach it to our children in Sunday school, but we just kind of leave it there. But the armor of God is something that equips us for life. It gives us functionality for life. 
It's something that we need all throughout our spiritual journey, from childhood and especially into adulthood more than ever. The armor of God is very needed in our life because there's a very real spiritual battle that we face. There's a very real enemy of our soul that's constantly trying to undermine your life. He's constantly trying to pull you away from your faith. But there is a very real God who is equipping you to stand firm. So that's the first thing, is that the armor of God is very practical. It's very functional in your life. The second thing that you need to know is that the armor of God is the armor of God. It's the armor of God. It's God's armor. God doesn't expect us to fashion our own armor. He doesn't expect us to come up with things on our own, defenses of our own in order to stand firm. God has given us his armor. Oops, sticky pages. God has given us his armor. And really what it is, is that God is giving himself to us. God is giving us his truth. God is giving us his righteousness. And this morning, God is giving us his peace. God doesn't ask us to fashion our armor. He doesn't say, you need to come up with your truth. You know, you need to rely on your righteousness to protect your heart. You know, you need to come up, you don't need to come up with your peace. You put on my armor. He simply invites us to put on his armor. And when we do this, when we put on the armor of God, we are actually putting on the very character of God. He's giving us the exact things that we need to stand firm against the attacks that we face in this world. So Jenna read the entire scripture passage of the armor of God. And this morning, I want to focus on what we're looking at sequentially, the next piece. And this is the shoes of the gospel of peace. So the scripture passage says this, specifically. Stand firm then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The right shoe allows us to live life well. So just try going for a day without shoes on your feet. You know, I challenge you, just try one day to go without shoes on our feet. Because we have shoes for every occasion of the day, don't we? You know, we have slippers that we put on to begin our day. And then maybe we put on runners to go for some exercise, to go for a walk. Or then maybe we put on work boots for construction jobs. Or maybe we put on dress shoes for office jobs. And then maybe in the evening we put on casual shoes to go out for dinner. And then we put back on our slippers for the evening. God says that you need the right shoes in order to navigate life well. You need the right shoes in order to stand firm. And the right shoes that we need on our feet is God's peace. The right shoes that we need in order to stand firm in this life and to travel well are the shoes of the gospel of peace. So oftentimes, you know, we don't pay a lot of attention to what's on our feet. You know, we may be concerned with more of fashion of shoes versus the function of our shoes. So when we were younger and first married, uh, and I had better knees, Laurel and I hiked a lot in Kananaskis country. You know, we were young. Uh, we had a little bit of disposable income. Uh, we had a much freer schedule. We didn't have kids. And so we had the time to do this. And there were a few times that we went on multi-day hikes with friends where you need to carry everything on your back. And when you realize, what you realize when you're doing these trips is that the greater the load that you carry and the longer that you need to carry it, the better and more robust that your shoes need to be, right? If you're just going on a day hike, you know, with a very light backpack, you know, a, a good pair of runners, light hiking shoes is really all that you need. But if you're carrying a backpack, a 50 pound backpack, you know, for a multi-day hike, you better invest in some very high quality hiking boots. They need to be made out of leather. You know, they need to have a solid shank. They need to have a good grippy outsole. You know, they need to be high cut so that they support your anchor. You know, they need to have a solid toe cap on it so that it protects your toes. So Paul, 
is describing the shoes of a soldier. He's using this as an illustration to talk about our spiritual life and to talk about what we need to put on our feet. And so he uses this, the, the illustration of the shoes of a soldier. And he's saying that these sh soldiers' shoes need to be robust. They're not just ordinary shoes. And so a Roman soldier's shoes were very protective. They were very strong. They did exactly what they needed to do so that the soldier could do their job. And so they were made out of bronze and they were made out of leather and they had multiple parts to them, an upper part that protected the, the, the leg from the knee down called the greave. And then they had the lower part, the shoe itself. So let's talk about the upper part first. So this is the part, this is called the greave. And it went from the top of the knee all the way down to the top of the foot. It was a beautiful shaped piece of metal that was molded to a person's leg, to their calf, and it gave an incredible amount of protection. You know, I think of a hockey player's shin pads, and I've seen hockey players take a hot puck off of their shin pad, and it gave an incredible amount of protection. Imagine if that was made out of metal. So that was the greave. That was the upper part of the shoe. Then there was the shoe part itself, the lower part, and this protected the soldier's foot. And there was a top plate to it that was a sculpted piece of bronze, and it covered from the toes all the way up until it met the greave at kind of the ankle. And then there was the bottom of it, and it was a metal plate that was surrounded with leather, leather and then it had metal spikes that protruded out of it. It was all held together with leather it was all made comfortable with thick pieces of leather. So you kind of get an idea of what the shoes looked like. So they were exceptionally protective. You know, you can imagine how sturdy they were. Nothing would pierce through the bottom of it. You know, you never needed to worry about where you were stepping. You know, if it was rocks or nails or spears or arrows, nothing was going to poke through the bottom of it. You know, you'd, never, you know, you'd also never really worry about slipping. You know, it doesn't matter what the, what the terrain was, the spikes would dig into the ground. You'd never worry about being pushed back because the spikes were there for that. And then the top of the foot was nicely protected, so you never needed to worry about something striking down on the top of the foot. And then, of course, the front of the leg was also protected. And the greave went all the way from the top of the foot to above the knee. And so you didn't need to worry about a sword or a club or a shield breaking your legs. You can imagine how strong it was from the toes all the way past the knee for the soldier. It was incredibly protective. But you can also appreciate that the shoes were also very dangerous too. They were very offensive too. They weren't just defensive because in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you could kick your opponent, right? Now a shin guard that's made out of bronze isn't gonna feel really good if it gets kicked and you have nothing on your unprotected leg, it's gonna do a lot of damage. And the spikes were also there because they maintain the soldier's footing, but you can also imagine that if your enemy was on the ground and you needed to kind of keep him on the ground, well, you could just kind of step on him and the soldiers and the spikes would do their job. So the Apostle Paul is being really descriptive here. You know, the readers of this letter, the Ephesian church, you know, they would understand what he's talking about when he just simply mentions the shoes of a soldier. You need the right shoe to do the job that you want it to, right? A boots of a hiker can carry a heavy load to places that are off the trail. The boots of a hiker, you know, they stabilize your feet and your ankles. They protect your feet from rocks and branches. You know, they give good grip when needed. And the shoes of a soldier would do the same thing. They would allow the soldier to function well in battle. They would protect them. Uh, they wouldn't need to worry about where they're standing. They wouldn't need to worry about the ground. If it was unstable in any way, that was still okay. The shoes allowed the soldier to stand their ground. They allowed the soldier to move swiftly and securely. But it's more than just a catchy illustration. It's more than just an illustration that people be like, oh yeah, I understand what Paul's talking about. 
Paul is saying this because he says this is an effective piece of spiritual armor that God has given to us. God knows that we need the right shoes on our feet, right? God knows what the terrain is like that we have to navigate through. He knows what the attacks are like. And he knows that we need robust, protective shoes. That these shoes need to be useful to stand your ground. And so God says what you need on your feet, what you need on your feet more than anything else, is my peace. There's a balance with a soldier's footwear. There's protection and there's weight. You know, you need to be adequately protected, but they also need to be lightweight enough so that they can march around on the battlefield. And what is it that allows us to move well and protects us well? It's God's peace. Paul says that the greatest thing that you need on your feet, the thing that you need to keep you secure, the thing that you need to protect you in battle, the thing that you need to be able to move quickly is God's peace. You know, so often we think of peace as surrender. You know, we think that in order to have peace, we need to give up and we need to give in to our enemy. But what exactly is the peace of God? Well, it's very different than the peace of this world. So Lloyd Corey, who is a humorist and author, once said, peace is that brief, glorious moment in history where everybody stands around reloading. It's true, isn't it? That's what the peace of this world is. It's just an opportunity to reload. We don't really know what peace is in our world. We don't. You know, there aren't too many years where there wasn't a war going on somewhere in our world. Our world says that we want peace, but our world is never able to achieve it. The best that our world is ever to achieve is that we have a standstill, really, that kind of just gives us enough time to reload our guns. But God's peace is very different. God's peace is something that exists even in the midst of chaos. It's not dependent on everything around us being peaceful because God's peace is dependent on God who is working everything out, who's working, who's in charge of everything in this world. And so the peace of God means that we can know that things are going to work out because God is in control. And so our journey can be good. Our journey can be filled with peace because of what God has done. So when we talk about the peace of God, there's two things that you need to know about it. First of all, there is peace with God. Now, peace with God is what a person experiences when he or she comes to the Lord for salvation. So Paul said this in Colossians 1.20. He said, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Peace with God is a state that we enter into, a condition that we enter into as believers. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, if you've called out to Jesus to be your Savior, then you have peace with God. You do. You don't ever need to ask the question, am I right with God? Because you are. You don't need to ever wonder if God has forgiven your sins, because he has. You don't, you don't ever need to wonder if God accepts and loves you, because he does. God has given us peace with himself, and this is the firmest foundation that you need to stand on in this life. Because our greatest purpose in life is discovering that I belong. Our greatest quest in life is discovering that I have purpose, that I have meaning. The greatest truth that you need to know is that you were created, that you have meaning, that you are loved by an infinite, creating, loving God of the universe. You have peace with God. And it's not a kind of peace that God just says, okay, you know, everything's good. I'll just leave you alone now. That's a truce. That's not peace. Peace with God means that everything has been made right. It means that everything that is broken is being restored. It means that everything that is dying is being brought back to life. Everything that we dare to hope for when we utter the word peace, God is bringing this about. 
And he did it through his son Jesus on the cross. And he's doing it in your life. And God says, this is the armor that you need to secure your feet with. In order to stand firm in this world, you need to stand on the reality that you have peace with God. But there's a second peace to understand, and that is the peace of God. Now, the peace of God is very different from peace with God. It's possible to have peace with God, but live in the reality where you do not have the peace of God. And so the Bible says this, again, in the book of Colossians. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Many people don't walk in the peace of God. Many people walk every day in anxiety and worry and in all kinds of distress. You know, I think that maybe we look at God and we say, yeah, God, thank you that I have peace with you. Thank you for what you have done with Jesus, but what about my everyday life? You know, what about the battles that I face every day that are knocking me off my feet? We're missing out on the peace of God. And so Paul says this, let the peace of Christ rule. Let the peace of Christ rule, because that's the key to understanding the peace of God. So what it is, he's talking about like an umpire, or a referee who would bring order to a game. Now, you may get frustrated with the referees, and if you watch enough hockey, that's going to happen naturally. But a good referee doesn't inhibit a game from happening. A good referee doesn't cause a game to not happen properly. A good referee doesn't frustrate the good players. When a good referee is in charge, the game is fantastic. It's incredible. The athletes are free to do their best. And so Paul says, let the peace of God referee your life. Let the peace of God call the shots in your life. Let the peace of God govern and give direction to your emotions and to your decisions. You know, really it comes down to the reality of who God is in your life. You know, remember that we're called to put on God's armor. God doesn't say, put on the best peace that you can muster. God doesn't say, you know, try to live your life in a Zen-like state. Try your best to find peace in this world. God says, put on my peace. Let my peace govern your life. Let it be the shoes that are on your feet. Let it be the shoes that you need to navigate your life. You know, we're all looking for peace in life, aren't we? We're all looking for peace in life. Where do you ultimately find your peace? Who is God in your life? What place does God have in your life? Do you walk through the uncertainty of life and the slippery places and the unsolid ground that so often life is? Do you walk through those places consumed with worry? Or do you walk through those difficult places with the faith that God is ultimately in control? Life is a journey. It's filled with valleys and mountaintops. You know, sometimes the journey of life, the trail is straight and flat. Sometimes it's windy and bumpy. But the question is, what do you have on your feet? What do you have on your feet that gives you the ability or not the ability to navigate all this? Peace from faith in God or worry that comes from the enemy? Is God at the center of your decisions? Or is he on the periphery? Someone that you'll consult if you need him. You know, I think that all of us would agree that we desperately need peace in life. And here's God offering the peace that we actually need. Peace that is now, that is able to allow us to stand firm against the spiritual battles we face. But do we allow this peace this daily abiding presence of God to rule in our lives? Or do we allow our circumstances to rule our lives, our emotions, our fears? God never says that the world around us will be secure. God never says that the world around us will be solid. Our footing isn't found in finding some kind of solid ground in this world. Our footing 
is made secure because of what is strapped to our feet. And Paul is very deliberate in saying that your footing can be made secure by finding it in the peace of God. Well, Paul keeps going. He's, <clears throat> excuse me. He says that the proper footwear of a soldier who is facing a spiritual battle can only be found in the peace of God. And then Paul says that the footwear that we have needs to be fitted and it needs to be ready. So there's a story of a kindergarten teacher who wanted to put her children, who wanted her children to put on their boots so that they could go outside for recess. And one little boy was having a lot of trouble getting his boots on his feet. And so he asked the teacher for help. But even with her pushing the boots and him pulling the boots, they still would not go on. But at last they got the boots on. But then the teacher scowled when the little boy said that they were on the wrong feet. Sure enough, they were. But the teacher kept her cool and they pulled the boots off and then attempted to get the boots back on, this time on the right feet. And at that point, after the boots were finally put on the feet again, the little boy announced that these were not his boots. And the teacher sighed and she pulled the boots off again. But then the little boy said that these were his brother's boots and his mom had made him wear them. Now, in spite of the fact that the teacher felt like crying at this point, she mustered up the strength to wrestle the boots back onto his feet. Success. Now, the teacher said, where are your mitts? To which the boy answered, I stuffed them in my boots. <laughs> we need shoes that fit well. So Paul says this, stand firm then, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The word fitted is this idea of having something securely fastened to your foot. Paul is saying that the shoes that God has provide, provided, these shoes of the gospel of peace, need to fit well. They need to be securely fastened. They need to be tied up well. Paul says that we need to tie peace onto our lives. If we only give peace a loose fitting in our lives, then the battles that we face are going to knock us out of place. And so Paul says you need to bind peace onto your feet. Bind peace onto the places that you go. Bind peace onto your mind and your emotions in the same way that a Roman soldier made sure that their shoes were tightly bound onto their feet. Because if their shoes didn't fit properly, they were in trouble. Because here's the weapon of the enemy. Here's the weapon of the enemy. Now, I don't know what's going on in all of your lives. I don't know the details of all of the battles, but I'm sure that there is a voice that's very familiar in it. Everyone is unique, and yet there is a voice that's familiar that's going on in our lives. And I know this because it's the voice that's in my life too. And I've heard it a thousand times. So here's the voice of the enemy. He says this, look around you. Does that sound familiar? Look around you. Don't you see everything that's going on? Don't you see what's happening in this world? Don't you see what's happening in your family? Don't you see what's happening in your job or in your school or with your friends or with your spouse or with your health? Aren't you worried about that? How are you supposed to navigate life with all these things going on around you? Look around you. Don't look up. No, look this way. The weapon of the enemy is to become focused on what we see going on around us and what we fear is going to go on around us and what we feel inside of us. But Jesus says, Look at what's on your feet, because it's my peace. It's a peace that the world cannot give you, a peace that the world cannot generate, no matter how hard it tries. It's a peace that you can't generate, no matter how hard you try, because the peace of God is a peace that overcomes the world. It's a peace that's greater than the world. It's a peace that's a formidable protection against everything that the world throws against us. 
The world says, look around you. That ground is just so unstable. But Jesus says, look at your feet and look at what they're equipped with. Look at the peace that's tied tightly to it. Let me close our time. Paul says that when we put on the shoes of God's peace, when we make sure that they're properly fitted, that they're properly secured, that there is a readiness that comes with it. When peace has its grip on our lives, Paul says that we become ready. We're ready to engage the battles. We're ready to confront the enemy. We're ready to stand firm. Paul is clearly saying, God is clearly saying that the greatest need that we have is to find secure footing in this world. It's the greatest need that we have, but the greatest secure footing that we can find in this world is the peace of God. And when that peace becomes foundational in our lives, we have a firm footing. We find our security. You don't need to show me your hands, but how many of you are desperate to find security and peace in this world? Me too. And God says, pay attention to your feet. Pay attention to what it is that you're trying to stand on. God says, step into my peace. Tie it tightly around your feet. Learn to move in my peace. Learn to let my peace rule in your life. Learn to trust my peace. And it will give you security. It will give you a firm place to stand on. It will give you the ability to dig in when everything is being pushed against you and the ground is not secure anymore because the right shoes allow us to stand firm. The right shoes allow us to stand firm. Let's pray. God, we simply open our hearts to you. Where are you in our life? Are you on the periphery? Or have we sunk our faith in you and you alone? Do we trust you? Do we believe that you have overcome the world? Do we believe that you are bringing everything about towards your purposes? And do we believe that you have given us that peace, that conquering peace, as footwear to strap to our feet so that we can stand firm? God, we want to let the peace of Christ rule. We want it to be the thing that we stand on. So we ask that you would show us how we do that. Ask Holy Spirit that you would reveal to us how we can place our faith in you, how solid of a foundation our faith is in you, how much we need you in our lives, and how secure we are when we stand with shoes fitted and ready with the gospel of peace. We praise you, God. We love you. Amen.